He said, I don't think so. Maybe we can talk about what it means to be unreflective and then, you know, bring in your question about, I suppose, the welfare system. You know, it's like someone coming to your office and saying, I'm going to be late on the assignment, is that okay? And you say yes. You do it the first time and then you do it the second time and then you do it the third time. And imagine that the semester is like 20 weeks long. And once they get in the habit of assuming that it's just okay to be late, then they'll be late always for this class, and then they'll be late for other classes. And then before you know it, everything about their life becomes late. So initially, I think the welfare system, any system that involves compassion and empathy, begins because you want to put yourself in the other person's shoes and feel what they're going through and rightly so because life is tough and some people are not as politically cunning you know and so they become kind of victim of a system that's just very cruel and corrupt uh, but you know it's I think it's part of our DNA to get anything for free if possible without any amount of work and uh, you know, if you have always been in the business of plagiarizing, in other words, you know, Iran, where I'm from, is an interesting environment, at least it used to be when I was born. My father worked for the oil company, as many other people did. And so you have children, and then you send your kids to school, and then you find them a job, parents do. And then you find them a companion, and then you buy them a house, and then you buy them a car. And they simply learn how to live their life by modeling. In other words, your parents are your best models. And there are no divorces, nobody drinks, nobody smokes, and if they do, everything is in hiding. So for the most part, your GPS to life is very clear. You know where to go, when to go. Now, once in a while, what happens, it's kind of like the movie, um, or if you've read Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice, that you have, you know, 50 girls in your family, and they're all waiting for a man to knock on the door and take them away from, you know, their parents and give them a house and family life and all that. There is one girl in that family who's a black sheep. She has been stung, or she has been victimized by the gods because she wants to kind of be authentic, be creative. And so the idea of just marrying any man, the idea of marrying for money, the idea of marrying for a house, it just doesn't taste good to her, you know. So if you have had tastes of inspiration, creativity, authenticity, that your life belongs to you and you want to do something very unique and special with it, plagiarism is going to be very difficult. Welfare is going to be very difficult. Asking other people for help all the time and just pushing away responsibility you know, for your own life is going to be very, very difficult. If on the other hand, you have been seasoned by simply surviving life, and for the most part, life is something to uh, you know, wrestle with and hopefully survive. Whatever creativity you have inside you, it just kind of zips out very, very young in age. Um, you know, the other part which kind of links itself to Julian's question is it doesn't serve you well to think because examination, what it does is it takes you back in time where you have to process certain modes of thinking and feeling and acting. And there's a good chance that when you begin to examine things, I mean, you know, in a couple of minutes, Jameson is going to go skydiving. This is not about you, really, or, or what you do. Uh, I mean, it's nice to be inspired, to be in the cradle of thrills once in a while, you know, because that's what all human beings want. They want to, I mean, life kind of just clips your wings. And once in a while, you want to do crazy things to come to life. Some people go into stealing things. 
Uh, some people want to plagiarize on their exam. Whatever the case may be, it doesn't really matter. But you want, you want to just feel alive. You want to feel your own existence. You're just so tired of writing these essays that mean nothing to you. And once in a while, you want to go outside of the bounds and, and do something that says, yes, I exist. But when you begin to examine something, reflect on what exactly it is that you want to do to bring you to life. And it's, you know, it's like getting high in a different way. You know, it's not so much smoking weed, uh, it's not watching porn, it's basically going skydiving. It lasts for about five seconds or five minutes, but then you will land and you will walk and you realize, well, once again, you're aimless. One of the reasons as to why life for all of us is meaningful is because there is no reflection involved. There is no examination involved because the moment you do, most of the things that you do under the sun become irrelevant. I mean, consider for a moment that you have studied the structure of society, you have structured, you have studied the difficulty of saving money, of making money, of living amongst people. How difficult it is, especially in the 21st century, to find meaning, to find identity, since almost everything that used to give us a GPS to life is out the window. You can't even trust the most basic things, such as your own gender, for example. Now, you want to examine as to whether or not it's worth having a child, or being a father, or being a mother, or having a family. All the political aspects of life aside, to put your kids to school in a place where education doesn't really take place, and whatever you think helps you, or makes you learn, or gives you knowledge, in reality of life, it serves you no purpose. You want to be kind, you want to be understanding. In the end, you realize that your kindness and understanding actually makes you into a victim. People just kind of push you around all the time. They take advantage of you, you know. So, and then you ask yourself, okay, well, there are also all these different stages that people have to go through. And every new stage makes the previous stage completely irrelevant. And add to it the fact that all of life, perhaps many parts of it, has a good amount of disappointments. Add to it, you get old. Add to it, your body fails you. And so you say, do I really want to bring another child? Well, if you were to think about life in that particular way, nothing about life would be worth doing. That's why people like Socrates, like Gandhi, like the Buddha, they are poison to human life. Reflection is something that goes against life. It doesn't favor life. It doesn't help life. It hinders it. Because once you remove meaning from something, then you realize it serves you no purpose. It serves you no meaning, no relevance. And then you say, okay, so what am I doing this for? You know, uh, consider, for example, her question, which is, I lost my textbook. But why the hell do you need a textbook? I need to write an essay. But you don't really care about the essay. You don't really care about the book. You don't really care about the contents of the book. Because if you did, you would probably purchase another copy for yourself, right? But because none of those things really matter, the best way to do it is just see if you can borrow a book from someone, you know, write a couple of paragraphs, get a C or a B or an A and be on your way. And so when you kind of put yourself under a microscope and examine and observe what exactly it is that you're doing, if your conscience, this tiny little mirror within you that reflects back to you what you have become, if you still have one of those tiny reflectors within you, it makes you living with yourself very, very troublesome. <clears throat> so, you can reflect on anything if there is no pain. And pain can be physical, pain can be emotional, pain can be psychological, you know. And if you're away with all those basic stuff, your pain is one of, you know, spiritual, that your body no longer serves your purpose. Are you done? Oh, oh. yeah, yeah. 
you know, your emotions, which is nothing but a collection of your body in a physical space being imposed upon by all these various forces. That's where your emotions come from for the most part. Uh, they are nothing but, you know, a collection of narratives created by your environment, whether they're parents, your friends, school, advertisement, doesn't really matter. Even your emotions don't really belong to you. And if you were to change your location, if you were to go, say, to India and stay there for about 20 years, everything about you would be completely different. Uh, you know, it's kind of like people who serve in the military. You know, you have two lives. One life is lived uh, boots on ground. That you do things that are really extraordinary. You're willing to sacrifice your life for people you don't even know. I mean, they're your friends, they're your buddies. Uh, you both signed up to go to the military and now you're serving in Afghanistan or Iraq or Cambodia or Nicaragua. And there is a war that's going on and a stranger, American, speaks the same language as you do, came from the same town that you did, but you don't know him from Adam. And yet, there is this underlying meaning that the both of you share. But then you are done with your service, you come back to Oakland, for example, and what do you do? You stand in line to buy milk. You went to Iraq to fight for democracy, supposedly, for justice, for equality, to eradicate hunger, starvation, inequality, racism. And now what? You're, all of your life's troubles is about rent and, uh, you know, your wife or your husband telling you to do this and do that, your kids screaming all the time. And it's a life really not worth living at all. So, again, if, if there is no pain, there is no need to reflect. And most of your intellectual prowess, most of your intellectual energy is spent on trying to manage the basics of life. How can I pass a class? Not whether or not philosophy is valuable for life, but how do I pass my philosophy class? For example, you know, uh, why am I going to school? It's something that around the 19th century was, it was, came to be called instrumental rationality. It's an instrument. In other words, if you want to say, I don't know, unbolt your skateboard. Well, you go to the garage, you grab a couple of wrenches. These are instruments you use. And once your job is done, you put the tools back in the box, for example. And rationality is very much the same way. You know, you're having a glitch in your relationship. Your wife doesn't understand you or your parents don't understand you. So you go to the bookstore and you grab some books. Or you just kind of sit in your room and you reflect how you can best manage this friction with your parents. And then once you have, you know, some relative solutions to your dilemma, you go sit them down and say A, B, C, D. And all of a sudden the irons have been wrinkled out. It's not because you understand the function of what your intellect is supposed to do on perhaps a different stage simply because of basic life's issues, you know. Um, so you don't really get a chance to appreciate a thing for what it is. That if your mind, for example, has the capacity to really wrestle with some of the great questions that have been around for a long, long time, your job, or at least the way you use your intellect, is to figure out the most basic things of life. And for where you are, they're very, very important. For what Socrates is, it's not important at all. And I think if you were to look at reflection as an art form, like tattooing, for example, where you have to kind of become very proficient and that happens after many, many years of just experimenting with your art, with your craft until you become really good. Reflection is very much the same way. And one of the things you need to know about reflection, regardless of how great you may be at it, it's always going to be limited because of your age, because of your culture, because of your experience. So you're always going to have some blind spots, always. And you need to make sure that once you become, to some extent, good at the art of reflection, should another give you another perspective, you need to kind of put your own ego aside, your inflated self of sense, self, and you know, allow this perspective to kind of enter into you, to add more to your collection. Um, but it's good to be unreflective. Uh, the very foundation of life rests on unreflectiveness. Um, 
You know, one of the reasons, for example, that perhaps people who are a little older have difficulty, say, dating, they know too much about themselves. They know too much about their life. They know too much about their past, their history. Self-deception becomes a little bit more difficult. When you're young, you really don't have very much knowledge about anything. So you kind of just wing it. And because your recovery period happens very, very quickly, you know, imagine if you were to throw a party for 20 of your friends. You know, you go shopping for like two, three, four, five days, you clean the house, people come, trash your house, you spend a day cleaning the house, spend maybe five, six, seven hours resting, you're fresh the next day. Kevin, Sonia, myself, if you were to throw a party for 20 people, first it's gonna take us 20, uh, about a month to get everything organized. Then when people come to our house, we'll laugh. At the same time, we kind of hate ourselves for throwing a party. Then, <laughs> then when they leave, we kind of cuss everyone out behind their back. And um, we kind of fight with our wives or companions as to why we even did this in the first place. And then it's going to take us about two, three months to recover physically, you know. And so the younger you are, the more unreflective you are, which means that you can easier kind of just flow through life and allow life to kind of damage you, push you around, and you recover relatively quickly. Um, so if you were to kind of exercise reflection, examination from a very young age, it would be devastating. And there is also this other aspect. Um, if I was to kind of put this on the board, <clears throat> what usually happens is so we have five senses, right? And the function of these five same senses is to interact with the, its environment. And what these five senses ultimately do is they bring about messages. Most of the messages that come to us, whether it's through your eyes, through your nose, whatever the case may be, <coughs> they are what we call random. They are not guided. It's not like this class where I come to class and say, so what do you guys want to talk about? And everybody says, well, you know, I've been taking class for the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years. There is a certain plan, specific plan in every class. You know, I go to class and my instructor says, today we're going to do algebra. We're going to take notes. There is a quiz. There are assignments with specific questions. <clears throat> so most of the messages that come to us are quite random. You know, we have no hand in it. You know, it's not like you came to class wanting to reflect deeply on things. It just happens to you. Now, <clears throat> The messages that usually come to us, we have no choice but to take them in. You know, you hear them. It doesn't mean that just because you hear something, you're able to actually listen because you need more focus, more attention. You just hear things. You know, it's like you're washing dishes, your wife or your husband is talking, or maybe you're sitting in a class, you know, you're just fantasizing while randomly in the background, there is Amir Sabz already just rambling on, right? Listening means you have to kind of move to this other stage, which is a bit, bit more mature, focused, responsible stage, which is listening. The moment you begin to pay attention, now you engage in the act of hearing. Now you focus on words and their meaning and what they could mean for you, how relevant they are for you. Now... Once you begin to actually pay attention and hear to what you're listening, what happens is if you happen to be inspired, you will move into trying to understand what exactly it is that you're listening to or hearing. Okay. Now, the first stage in understanding is that it has no practical application. It's abstract. It lives in your imagination. It's like you coming to class and saying, I just had a fight with my companion or my parents. How do I resolve the issue? Okay. It's a very focused question. But what you need to understand, because 
your question is very, very specific. It contains a good amount of bias. So you're only going to listen to the part that will serve you. You're a tax collector, okay? The things that don't serve you, you just dismiss. And there's a good chance it, the things that you dismiss may actually be more helpful, okay? Now, let's just say your question is, your father is telling you things, you don't like what he's telling you, and you want to move. And my response is, stay at home, there is free food, free laundry, free rent. And then I'll say, listen, your father is about 20, 30 years older than you are. You know, it's difficult being married, it's difficult having children, it's difficult making money, it's difficult sustaining a life that maybe 80% of that life is just troublesome. Now you understand all of this stuff. Now your first stage of understanding is untested. In other words, you sit there, I speak, you listen, you hear, you process, you understand and it makes sense. And you assume that with this understanding, when you go home and look at your father, you'll be able to receive him well. But that's not the case. What the next stage is you go home. Now, your father is there. Now, he's going to kind of bombard you with questions and statements. Now, your understanding will be tested by real life. Whatever assumptions you had in the first stage of understanding, all the assumptions are now being wrestled with. And for the most part, you're going to lose. So you come to class, you assume you understand, right? You become more significant in your own eyes, more relevant, more mature. You go home and your father deflates you. You hate me, you hate yourself, you hate your father. Okay? And then your confidence, all those things go away. Now... If, for example, you know, as, say, an educator, that all students who come into your classes, even though they may be inspired, their understanding exists at a very, very raw and infantile stage, even though they may string words together very, very nicely, for you it doesn't really mean anything because that understanding has not been tested. Now, how do you test an understanding? Well... How do you test anything? There is a story by Jean-Paul Sartre, the French philosopher. And you know, it's interesting about people who have seen wars, uh, whether civil or otherwise. You know, one of the nice things about Sigmund Freud is that he came at a time where World War I and World War II, World War II was starting to take place. And it really just devastated everything about us. The fact that people are nice and decent and moral, the fact that religion, in fact, has a heavy hand in human life. And what the two wars did was, for the most part, got rid of a lot of fallacious assumptions about how noble human beings really are. You know, I mean, consider what has happened in America the past, this is the fifth month of the year, so it's about 150 days, let's just say. Up to date, we have had 205 mass shootings. It's incredible. The year isn't even over. It's not even half the year. You know? And you've had more mass shootings in the days. You know? And then you kind of sit back and say, okay, well, how functional is this culture? I mean, if you were to kind of reflect on the stuff. Do I really want to bring a child? In fact, I was thinking, you know, uh, on Friday that maybe I should come to class and lock the door. And whenever you have a student who's late, just go over there and open the door and let them in. Because what happens in this particular environment is that your trust factor goes away, your faith goes away, everything becomes uncertain. You can't trust anyone or anything. You know, and that is what happens when you have a lot of reality being pushed in your face and where you have to examine and observe and reflect. Nothing survives reflection. It's impossible. You know, one of the best ways to kind of understand this, at least intellectually at this stage, is um, if you have some extra cash on you, you know, go to Amazon and order the dialogues of Plato. You can probably get it by 20, for 20 bucks or so. 
or if you don't want to, you know, you can PDF it online. And, you know, that's what Socrates does. He just examines everything. You know, I want to know what a philosopher is, or I want to know what education is, or I want to know what marriage is. And people kind of come up with their own interpretation. And he says, no, that's not sufficient. Tell me more. And then at a certain point, you know, you uh, just become angry because you have no idea what, you know, Socrates is asking, what is demanding, and what is wanting. And you kind of feel incompetent. It's always best if you don't encounter a Socrates. I mean, that's why conformity and assimilation are favorable for us. People think the way we do. They feel the way we do. You know? If, for example, you don't like your father, what you'll do is... Uh, good morning, Miss Charlotte. And if you have like, five or six brothers, uh, let's say two of them enjoy your father, but four of them don't, there's a good chance that you'll be closer to the four that don't like your father. Because the other two will force you to question. Anyways, anything we can talk about? Yeah, yeah. Bethany? Okay. Narcissism in a parent? Narcissism, you said? I was discussing, my sister was discussing her relationship with her mom. Think about narcissism. There are a different, a few different versions of uh, narcissism. Uh, it comes from the word Narcia, who used to be a mythological figure in the Greek world. Uh, Narcia, he was cursed in the sense that when he was born, uh, and one of the things you need to understand about the world of mythology is that different texts, different books, different authors, uh, kind of say different things about a certain figure. So, since all of us have no choice but to be biased, I'm going to use the version that best suits me and my agenda and my ways of thinking. So, the versions that I have read and I've enjoyed very much are Narcia is a kid who was born cursed. He always wanted to kind of see and understand how he looks and why he looks the way he looks. But every time he saw his own reflection, he came to realize that they're unclear and he can be certain that the reflection of himself is in fact the one that is real. So he goes on this quest for his entirety of life, going from person to person, pond to pond, pulls a water, uh, to see whether or not he can figure out who he is and what he looks like. At last, he finds this pool of water. It has some ripples, but unlike all the other, you know, things that he has experienced, it's not as fierce. So he just sits there and patiently for the ripples or the waves to go away, and eventually it does. And then once the water is calm, it begins to see the way he looks. And he falls in love with himself. And one of the things about narcissism is that, that there is something about you that says, I like myself. But more than that, I love myself. Now, you know, you can have an 18-year-old saying, I love Johnny. But this particular love has no examination behind it, no reflection behind it. It hasn't been pushed and tested by life. And so the 18-year-old is willing to sacrifice everything, their life, their body, their money, their time, their energy. And of course, after two, three years, as most of us are, you know, experienced about this stuff, you come to realize that the other person betrayed you, you betrayed you, everybody else betrayed you, and now you're just profoundly bitter. The other forms of narcissism is that 
I say to you, Sonia, you look good. You say, well, okay, thank you. But deep down, you have a good amount of doubt. What if Amir is lying to me? And it's one of the things that Jean-Paul Sartre mentioned to us, which is he wrote a play called No Exit. And in the play, it's about, you know, all of us in this class. Are you going to her saying, so how do I look? She says, you look great. You ask him, how do I look? And he says, you look great. But deep down, you know that people can't be trusted. You know that people lie all the time. And though she's praised you, and so even though he's praised you and everyone else in this class has praised you, there is this hint of doubt that lives inside you. What if they're all wrong? You know, and so you go on this quest to find someone who can give you an unvarnished reflection of you. And you do so because you are self-involved, because you are self-centered. And it's a good way of being because you no longer trust books, you no longer trust assumptions, you no longer trust advertisement. It needs to, and you basically what you want to do is you want to tap into your intuition, but not the intuition of an 18-year-old. An intuition of a 50 or a 60 year old man or woman who has been around, has been tested, has been beaten, has been able to kind of get themselves up and go on the quest again only later on to find certainty, you know. Uh, you can find a good amount of clear reflection and that's where the word nar narcissism comes about, narcia. And once you find this unvarnished reflection of yourself, that's where your Garden of Eden is. That's where home is. You rest. That becomes your Sabbath. Even if I was come to come to you and say, Sonia, you're an idiot. That's fine. I know who I am. And remember, this idea that I know who I am is not coming from an 18-year-old. Someone who is seasoned. Someone who knows. <clears throat> the idea that you have, for example, the Gospel of John in which he says, I am about almost 50 times, you know, slap me on the right cheek, I'll offer you the ref left. When you say I am, I mean, it's such an amazing thing. Uh, you know, 18 year old says, I am in love. Well, just give it some time, give it some space, give it some air, give it some history. And then you say, no, I think I was wrong. The I am chef shifts from I love to I hate to I am indifferent. I will never again love. That's the instability of when you're young and unexperienced and untrained and unseasoned. When you're, for example, 60 and you've gone through four or five marriages or maybe just one marriage and you've really been tested in that marriage, you know what pain is, you know what betrayal is, you know what conflict is, you know what compromise is. So when you say, I know marriage, I am marriage, I am the embodiment of marriage, it means that there is something about you that is fundamentally crystallized, it remains unchanged. Now, when you speak about, well, you know, my sister and then my father, the question is, who is your father? Remember, we have two forms of narcissism. The first thing you need to understand is the moment every infant comes about, the first thing they do, they scream. They don't really care about the fact that the parents have gone through hell the past nine months, especially the woman, the last like four months of her pregnancy. She can't sleep, she can't eat, she's always nauseous, irritable. Life is tough on her. Her body is changing, she's hormonal, okay? Now, the infant doesn't care about any of that. Comes out screaming. I want to be nursed. I want to be held. So narcissism starts at a very, very, very young age. Okay. And you remain self-important for a long, 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 long time because your desires are untested, unexamined. You're unreflective. Everything you believe in, you assume, uh, you think to be relevant, important, valuable. And that could last till the time you die, you know. Uh, there is another kind of fatherhood or being a father, which is you think very highly of yourself from the moment of birth. And then life happens. Something happens to you where you're beaten down, you get depressed. We went through the five stages in the class on Thursday, which is... You deny that you're not great. 
because you continuously want to believe that you are in fact great. So you kind of deny all the realities that are being shoved in your face. Say, no, 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 that can't be true, I'm still great. But there comes a point where you can no longer deny that you're a douchebag, that you're an idiot. And what happens, it makes you really, really angry because for the first time, you're faced with the reality of who you are. There is no longer denying it. You don't have the power to deny it. Uh, you know, it's kind of like an alcoholic. I mean, it's interesting the way things begin, you know. Life is tough. You don't have the proper tools to kind of deal with the difficulties of life. And, you know, you do what you can to kind of numb the pain. It's just too much responsibility, you know, being married, paying rent, having a job, uh, your body being tired. Everything is just against you. And so you take, you know, uh, some alcohol. And it feels good. You forget. And... Uh, you know, because life puts you in prison <clears throat> and the spirit that lives in alcohol gives you wings and you remove or remove from the prison of life. Uh, and that's why we call wine or alcohol, you know, if you go to liquor stores, you know, wine and spirits. <clears throat> 